IRS website into the FAFSA. It's not probably going to be available to you to use your first year because you want to get your FAFSA information in as quickly as possible. Um, but in years two, three, and four, get your taxes done and then file your FAFSA and just pull that data in automatically. The aid office knows it's right then. The federal government knows it's right then. Less likely to get selected for a verification process where the aid office has to ask you for all this tax data. So if you have the option to use that in years two, three, and four, do it. So can you use it at all in the first year or no? You can if you wait a little longer. Your taxes are done. It usually, the IRS usually tells us that it will be available in February. It takes them two weeks to process an electronically filed tax return, at least two weeks. So from, let's say you file your taxes February 10th. So it's going to be at least March 1st before your tax data is available to pull into your FAFSA. If you file your FAFSA March 1st, the aid office probably won't have a financial aid package to you until the second week of March. So you want to make sure you file as early as you can so you get that aid package to make your decision. More timely submissions. These are just all reasons why, why to do it on the web, but really everybody does it on the web anyway. So this is just information, again, on the IRS match. If they find your IRS tax information, you pull it right into the FAFSA. It's cleaner, it's easier, we know it's accurate. Again, reduces information requested by the aid office. There are some instances where you can't use the IRS data retrieval tool. If you're married and you file separate tax returns, you can't do it. If for some reason you have to file a foreign tax return, you can't use it. And Dr. Belville's in the house, so I'll just say, if you own your own business, I have a lot of parents who own their own business and they file a tax extension, they don't do their taxes until October, it hurts their student, especially if they're selected for verification. I still have a few students at WNJ whose parents just filed their taxes, and I have not been able to get their tax information to complete their aid package. So they're still sitting there, not having aid, and probably not going to be able to register for next semester because their bill's not paid. So do your taxes as early as you can, especially during these four years, and get your FAFSA done as soon as you can. All right. So, every parent and every student needs a federal PIN number. That's the website to get a PIN number, pin.ed.gov. That PIN number will be yours for your FAFSA filing every year, and it will be yours to electronically sign your loan applications through the federal government. So your Stafford, your Perkins, and your PLUS. So the FAFSA on the web worksheet, which I said I do, has the instructions. It's going to gather the information that you put on the FAFSA. So what is it asking for? The student's general demographic information, social security number, birth date, name. Do not put nicknames, legal names. What the schools typically do is they pull your FAFSA data in by your legal name and by your social security number. So if either of them don't match, it gets rejected. So you want to make sure you use them late. I've had somebody use their nickname before. I'm like, who is this person? I can't find her. She used her nickname, not her legal name. So make sure you're doing that. It's going to ask the student's marital status if there's any drug convictions. This is the question on the FAFSA. If the student has been arrested, convicted for a drug felony, they are not eligible for financial aid. There is an appeals process that they can go through with the federal government, but they are not eligible. The selective service issue that I talked about, and they want to know the level of parents' school completion. It's just a data collectible thing. We don't do anything with it. The federal government is just trying to keep track of how many families have completed college education. There's a section on the FAFSA that asks about the student's dependency. Most of your students are still going to be considered a dependent on you. Regardless of your willingness, to pay for college expenses. The federal government uses these questions to determine whether you should be paying for their 
college education. So if you answer no to all the questions, the student is a dependent. If you answer yes to any of the questions, the student is considered an independent student. And I'll just quickly go through the questions. So they want to know if the student's 24 years of age or older, if the student's married, if they are going for a master's degree, so they already have their bachelor's. And that's another question on the FAFSA that a lot of students don't answer correctly. It asks what degree you are attaining. And I have students to put, oh, I'm going to go on and get a PhD, so I'm going to put PhD. Well, when they do that, that kicks them out of some aid programs, the Pell, the state grant, because it thinks they already have all the degrees prior to that. So you are getting a bachelor's, put bachelor's. If you're getting an associate's, put an associate's. Can I ask a question about that? Uh -huh. You're going to put bachelor's for now. Yes. Are you currently serving on active duty? Are you a veteran? Do you now or will have children who receive more than half of their support from you? And that is an important question, too, because we do have 18, 19 year olds that have children. But if that student is not the one that's providing more than 50% of their financial support, they're still living with parents, and parents are providing their housing. Um, paying their bills, then they're still going to be considered dependent and parent information has to go on the FAFSA. Um, are you a ward or legal uh, in custody of legal residence? I mean, oh, okay, wait a minute. Are you, as determined by a court, an emancipated minor? Um, are you in legal guardianship? Are you an orphan or ward of the court? Or are you now homeless or has a school liaison? confirmed that you were homeless, if you answer no to all of those questions, you're still considered dependent upon your parent. Your parent information has to go on the FAFSA. And doesn't matter if your parent says you're on your own with college costs. Their information still has to go on the FAFSA. So the information about the parents, tax information, you're entering your adjusted gross income from the prior year, your federal taxes paid, your income earned from work for both parents. They're going to ask if you are a dislocated worker. If you answer yes to any of the federal means tests, if you're receiving free or reduced lunches is one of them, any TANF benefits, um, you'll answer yes to those, yes or no. And it's going to ask for your asset value. What it's going to do on the website is it's going to say, based on your age and how many people are in the household and how many people are in college, it's going to ask, are your assets greater than X number of dollars? And it's going to be different from every, for every one of you based on all of that information. So if you say, yes, my assets actually are more than that, you're going to have to enter your actual asset value as of the date you're filing the FAFSA. And it's net value. So asset value minus any debt held on it, net value. If it says, are your assets greater than 60000 and you say no, so you just answer no, it skips over all those asset questions then. And then untaxed income, it's going to ask you if you are receiving any untaxed pensions, retirements. Social Security benefits do not go on the FAFSA, so if you're receiving any type of Social Security benefit, you do not have to report that. Um, any money that you're putting into a 401k, has to be reported as untaxed income. Even though you can't use it and shouldn't take it out to use it for educational expenses, most of your 401k money is taken out of your pay pre-tax, so they want to know the amount that that is. And then it's going to ask the same information on the student, which the student usually doesn't have a lot, even if they work. You can put their income earned from work on there, um, but they usually don't have any asset information. Um. I have a question. My ex-husband, um, you know, obviously we don't you know, live in the same household and our incomes are significantly different. Um, when filling out this FAFSA, does both his information and mine or just the one that my daughter lives with? Right. Very good question. Did everybody hear the question? Okay. So in a divorce situation, the parent that the student lives with is going to be the parent who files the FAFSA. If that parent is remarried, that remarried spouse has to be on the FAFSA as well because they're looking at family, household, income. Uh, and you would answer the question for parent, are you currently, 
it asks you what your current marital status is. A lot of divorced families answer that incorrectly and put, well, we're divorced, even though the parents remarried. You, you're not looking at what is your biological parents' marital status. You're looking at whoever you're living with now, what is their marital status? So if you're remarried, you would put, I am married, and then you and your spouse's information will go on the FAFSA. Ex-husband has nothing to do with it. Now, in the event of, say, my daughter would go to live with him, how long would she have to live with him um, for his income to be one that would be on the FAFSA? It's for the year prior. Okay. Yeah. Some additional information they asked. The college that you want your data to be sent to, on the website you can put up to 10 school codes. There will be a drop down box so you don't have to know the school code. If you call the school, they will give you the school code. Um, but you can just use the drop down box. Up to 10 schools can get your information. It's going to ask you if you're living on campus, uh, living at home, or living off campus. Those are three separate choices. And if somebody prepared the FAFSA for you, that's going to ask for the FAFSA preparer information. Um, Sometimes it asks you for a certificate of educational purpose. This is usually in a case where it's an adult student that's already gone through this process. Uh, so you probably won't encounter that. Um, what I will tell you, the FAFSA is free. Free application for federal student aid is the name of the application. There are FAFSA.com websites and FAFSA.net and FAFSA.org and all of those ask you to pay $79.95 to complete your FAFSA. FAFSA.gov is the free site. I still have parents that will pay. I had two this year. Well, I found my FAFSA. And they used one of these sites that charged them money, and they paid it, and they completed it, but that company never submits it. It's a scam. And I don't know why the federal government lets them use those web names, but they do. So FAFSA.gov. It's also required to have your signature, so parent with a PIN number, student with a PIN number. You parents and students both sign Yes, out. parent and student. You can do it now. You can get your PIN numbers now. Um, if you don't use your PIN number within like an 18-month period, it'll become delete, deleted from their system, and you'll have to get a new one. But you could get them now for seniors. For juniors, I would wait until next year at this time. You could also print out the signature page and physically sign it and send it in, but that takes longer, so it just delays all, all of your aid packages. So some frequent errors on the FAFSA that we encounter. The Social Security numbers, make sure they're correct. The divorced and remarried parental status that we just talked about. Um, the income earned by parents and step-parents. The income, even if you use the IRS data retrieval tool, it doesn't pull in your income earned per parent. It just pulls in your adjusted gross income, your taxes paid. If you had any um, annuities on your taxes, it'll pull in that information. You need to physically on the FAFSA say, okay, parent one earned this much money and parent two earned this much money. Don't lump it all into one. The reason being is there are allowances built into the formula that the government uses for each parent that works. So if you have two parents working, you get a bigger allowance, which makes your EFC lower. U.S. income tax is paid. It's right on your tax return number, but if you're estimating, sometimes parents estimate and they look at how much is withheld from their W-2. And what is withheld is typically not what you end up paying to the federal government. You can get a refund, or you can even have to actually have to pay more. So just make sure when you have your that your tax is actually done to go back to that FAFSA and update everything. Household size, it asks you for the number of people in your household. That is people as the parent you are supporting financially more than 50%. There are a lot of households now that grandparents are living in the household. If grandparents are living with you and you can document that you pay more than 50% of their living expenses, you can include them in your household size. But if they are receiving Social Security and all of their health care is paid, and you're really providing them just living expenses, you may not be financially supporting them more than 50%. So you, it's a, kind of a tight line there, but you have to just weigh what are they bringing in and what am I paying out for them. And then the number of people in college. As the parent, I could not put me enrolled in college 
on Trenton's FAFSA if I was enrolled in college. As a parent, if I was filing a FAFSA for myself, because I'm going back to school, and Trenton and Bevan are in school, then I could say, well, there's five in the household and three in college. But with Bevan being enrolled in college on his FAFSA, he can, I can only list him as enrolled in college, or if Trenton was at the same time, then two. So just make sure parent information about being enrolled in college cannot be on the student application. I have parents that will mess that up sometimes. And then your real estate investment net worth is sometimes kind of tricky. You do not have to provide the amount of the house that you're living in. But if you have a second house that maybe you rent out, or if you're lucky enough to have a house at the beach, you have to list that as an asset and put the net worth on there. You do not have to list any life insurance policies, only cash, savings, bonds, mutual funds, stocks, really. None of your IRAs go on there. None of your retirement pensions go on there. Okay, so what happens? You file your FAFSA, it goes to the central processing system, and they will notify the student, typically via email. When the student files the FAFSA, they put their email address on there. The student will get emails. Make sure the student is paying attention to their emails. FIA will communicate to the student via email. There is a state grant form that the student has to complete. You can do it right after you file the FAFSA, right online, but the student has to complete a signature page which has to be physically signed and returned to FIA. They will send that link to the student via email. So make sure they're paying attention. The link that goes to the student says, here's your student aid report. That's what the FAFSA result is called for the student. They will go back to the FAFSA.gov, enter their PIN number into the site, print out their student aid report. I always recommend you print it out, review it, to make sure that a number wasn't transposed or something looks wrong on it. Because we can go through it so quickly and enter the data. We may have missed that we transposed a eight and a zero or something, so just make sure. And you don't put cents on the FAFSA either. I've had students that made $1,000 and they put their zero, zero, and now it makes it look like they've made $10,000 and they're wondering why their ESC went up so high. That's usually why. The college that you listed on your FAFSA gets what's called an ICER. It's the same thing basically as a student aid report. We just call it something different to confuse everybody. But we will get that 10 to 14 days after you file, which then helps us to create your financial aid package. Review it for accuracy. Update your estimated tax data once your taxes are actually done. If you need to make a correction, you'll go back to the FAFSA.gov website. You'll enter the site. You'll correct all of the information that was incorrect. You have to submit all the way through and sign it with your PIN numbers again. So what's next? So the student is accepted for admission, has a FAFSA on file. The financial aid office will then create a financial aid award packet or an award letter. W&J's is a nice trifold. Allegheny's is a nice package. You will get that from each school that you put on your FAFSA. Some things to note. Pell Grants should be the same on every package. SEOG Grants won't. State Grants, depending on the cost of the school, may not be. But your Pell Grant should be the same at each school. So you want to look at the, the academic year costs. You want to talk to the school about how much do your costs typically increase from year to year. And again, what happens to my financial aid package from year to year? What happens if I have a GPA requirement for my scholarship and I don't make that GPA? Do I lose my scholarship altogether? Or is there some type of probation period? Do I fall to the next lowest one? Find out that information. I'll tell you, our highest GPA to keep at WJ is a 3-1, which I have outstanding high school students that come in and think, I can do a 3-1, that's easy. Totally different college classes than high school. And I have some that panic, and then they go below the 3-1, and they think, what am I going to do? Well, at WJ, we'll bump them down to the next scholarship level that they qualify for, but if they have financial need from the FAFSA, we'll typically replace that loss with grant because we don't want the student to feel a big difference and take a big hit in the costs. 
So when you're looking at the cost and you see your, what you're going to owe for this year, keep in mind you have four years of this. So consider that when you're looking at your aid packages. Again, pay attention to what aid is renewable. Federal and state aid is not automatically renewable. You have to file your FAFSA every year and qualify. And federal and state guidelines and parameters will change every year. Maximum and minimum amounts will change every year. So don't think that that federal and state dollar amount is guaranteed for all four years, because it won't be. <clears throat> Talked about the rest of those. Okay, special circumstances. There are some things that may be happening in your financial situation or may have happened after you filed the FAFSA that just cannot be reported on the FAFSA. The FAFSA questions are cut and dry. You've got to answer it based on last year's tax return. Since 2014, you may have lost your job, you may have taken a pay cut, you may have transferred jobs. That could have an effect on the amount of income that's coming into your household. So you want to notify the financial aid office of those circumstances because they are the only ones that can make changes on your FAFSA in these situations. The Department of Education can't. You can't go directly to them and you can't go to the FAFSA yourself and make the changes. The school has to. So the college will ask you for documentation to support what you're saying. So if a parent has lost their job, they'll ask you for a letter of separation. They'll ask you, are you receiving unemployment benefits? Give us the documentation on how much that is. And then the financial aid office will reevaluate your financial information to make it more accurate to your income for the 2015 year to make your financial aid package then maybe more pleasing to you. So here are some of the circumstances that cannot be reported initially on your FAFSA. Change in employment status, unusual medical expenses, change of parent marital status, um, dependent care expenses, and typically unusual dependent care expenses is typically for somebody who has uh, a child with some disabilities that has to be in special care during the day, and that can take a toll on the family's income. And then a student that just cannot obtain parental information, you definitely need to talk to the financial aid office in that situation. Okay, I know that's a lot of information, and I went through it quickly. Like I said, on January 13th, we will go through the FAFSA, screen by, screenshot by screenshot, of what, what, what is right on the website, and give you a little more in-depth um, overview of the FAFSA itself. What I would tell you to take away from this, apply to wherever you want to go to college. Don't let the sticker price of college scare you off from applying. Wait until you get your financial aid packages from each of those schools. In the information that I gave you in the packet, there are cost comparison sheets and there are financial aid comparison sheets. You can, you can put it, all that information in and see the difference yourself right on paper. Make sure you understand what is renewable, what isn't, requirements to keep it, um, timing. Make sure you're not missing deadlines, and apply for as many outside scholarships as you can, because any amount of, of money from out, an outside source helps you. Did you have a question, Angela? Um, I was just going to say, I know I saw it up on the screen, but can you mention it out loud about the yeah, for the seniors that are in the room, the earliest you can file for the 15-16 school year is January 1st, 2015. So for the juniors that are in the room, that would be January 1st, 2016. But for the juniors that are in the room, on the FAFSA.gov website, down on the bottom right, it's real, it's kind of hidden, there's a link for a FAFSA forecaster. The seniors could do this too, actually. You can go to the FAFSA forecaster, enter all the data, and it'll give you an estimated expected family contribution. So you can kind of get an idea of what your EFC is. You heard me say with the Pell Grant, EFC has to be less than 5,700 to get any type of Pell. For Pennsylvania State Grant, with the cost of a W&J college, your EFC has to be 14,000 or less to get a Pennsylvania State Grant. That'll vary based on the cost of the school, but for W&J cost 14,000 EFC or less, you're getting a, a PA state grant. 
So you can do the FAFSA forecaster and kind of get an idea of what your expected family contribution is. And you'll be shocked because it'll be way higher than what you, <laughs> what you thought it was. It usually is. Okay, questions? For the forecaster, do you have to have a number? No, for the forecaster, you don't have to have a PIN. You just enter the data, it'll give you, spit out an EFC. I have a question about the selective service. Now, when I put this out, my son's not going to be 18, so if he's getting answered no, so is he going to be ineligible? No, what it'll ask you for those that are under 18 at the time, it'll ask you, do you want us to submit your name to the selective service? They'll submit it, so once he's 18, it'll kick in. So oh, you can okay. answer it, yes, submit my name. Okay. So they'll, they'll do it for you. What was the website for selection? SSS.gov, Selective Service. It's based on your adjusted income, not your... Yeah, they look at your adjusted gross, adjusted gross income. After your deduction. Yes. That helps. Nice. <laughs> that helps. <laughs> That's real nice. <laughs> Jenny. Uh, you said Social Security has a pension of the money to help us all financially. Social Security benefits that are untaxed, that aren't showing on your tax return as part of your adjusted gross income, do not have to be entered onto the FAFSA. If your pensions and annuities, or if your pension is part of your income and shows on your adjusted gross income, then you don't have to list it anywhere else on the FAFSA. It's already as included as your adjusted gross income. However, if you have pensions that are untaxed or any type of an annuity payment that came to you that's untaxed, which means it's not showing on your adjusted gross income on your tax return, then you have to list that on the FAFSA as untaxed income to you. Yes? Um, my husband, my daughter's stepfather is um, applying for SSD Right. No, because this could be Social Security disability, correct? correct? Yes. So no, it would not be listed. 